Thank you very much, uh, John. Maraming salamat. At uh, magandang umaga sa inyong lahat. Let me, first of all, greet uh, our distinguished uh, guest, headed by the Senior Associate Justice of the Supreme Court, Justice uh, Antonio Carpio, and Mr. Visitor General, Prime Minister Virata Cesar Virata. And uh, I have to say hello to him, to Abe Kong, without whose uh, philanthropy this forum may not, uh, may not have taken place. And uh, to Dr. Andrew Tan, he owns this uh, hotel. <laughs> so we, we can't forget to acknowledge him. Our eminent uh, speakers and friends. Let me begin. Let me begin with a little known story, but very well recorded uh, story. How sweet potato or kamote in vernacular was introduced to China. I was told this when visiting the then overseas Chinese university in Fujian, way back in the mid-80s, when I was invited by the Chinese government to visit universities in China at the time when China was still closed generally to, to Filipinos. And I visited the overseas Chinese university in Fujian, Xiamen now, is it also called Xiamen, where most of our Philippine, Filipino Chinese immigrants come from. And they told me that uh, in the late 16th century, 1594, Fujian province was struck by a devastating famine because of a massive crop failure. And uh, a intrepid Chinese trader went to the Philippines to do some, got the potato plants, brought it to Fujian, showed it to the governor, and convinced that it's a fast-growing as well as a rich source of food. The governor of Fujian encouraged its farmers to plant sweet potato, kamote. And over a period of time, that kamote, that sweet potato, see the people of Fujian. The story of the kamote is also a tale of neighborly assistance and humanitarian act Filipinos extended to the Chinese people. And it tells us as well how deep-rooted in history relations between the two peoples. Contacts between China and the Philippines started, some historians said, as early as 972 AD during the Song Dynasty shown by Chinese porcelain and potteries on Earth here in the Philippines. Others claim that it, that that contact even began earlier during the Tang Dynasty. The first migration of ethnic Chinese to the Philippines, however, occurred during the Ming Dynasty, 1369 to 1644, and coincided with the coming of the Spaniards. Indeed, the history of Chinese migration to the Philippines is the longest in the region, owing to the fact that the Philippines is among the oldest trading partners of China via what, via then, 
an eastern route, an east ocean route called the Pacific in Chinese called Dong Yung Kwa or Dong Yung Fu. The seafarers during the, fear, the seafarers taking that route come mainly from Fujian province, and that explains why almost 90% of the Filipino Chinese in the Philippines come from Fujian, and principally just from one city, the capital city of uh, Jinjiang City, almost 60% of their immigrants. In 2005, the Chinese, the Filipino Chinese component of, our, of the Philippine population is almost 1.6%. It may be the smallest in terms of uh, size and number as compared to the other Southeast Asian countries, but Manila had the most ethnic Chinese of all capitals of Southeast Asia. And through migration, rather through integration and intermarriages, I suspect that 1.6 million is now easily much, much higher uh, during this year. And some even projected that that component is almost 15 to 20 percent of total Philippine population. That translates to about 10 million Filipino Chinese in our midst. And I think there is a very good and easy explanation for that uh, quick uh, assimilation because the Philippines, well, the Filipinos have been famous for its hospitable and welcoming uh, nature. And therefore, the integration into mainstream Philippine society was much faster in the Philippines in contrast to the experience of Chinese migrants in other Southeast Asian countries. Now, let's let's focus now. You know, I went into some details about this historical fact because I want also to frame the discussion not only in what John said should be an objective and uh, and constructive way, but I want also to frame in the case of the Philippines and China, in a historical uh, context, because the historical, cultural, and economic ties between our two peoples are quite uh, deep-seated. Now, back to, to the present, or fast forward to the present. In November 23, the Chinese announced a no-fly zone over a wide swath of territory in the east China Sea, within, within which these two disputed islands, small islands, occupied and controlled by Japan, but claimed by China, are located. And the response to that, not only by the, by the neighboring countries, but by also the Western powers, was quite swift. Japanese Foreign Minister Kishida swiftly called it a move, a one -sided, called the move a one-sided action that cannot be allowed, warning it would trigger unpredictable events. The United States responded quite strongly by sending two B-52 two B, uh, two B bombers over the area. And U.S. Defense Secretary Hegel, as well as John, Secretary John Kerry, described China's action as a destabilizing attempt to alter the status quo in the region. Australian Foreign Minister Julie Bishop weighed in reiterating Australia's stance against any unilateral action to change the status quo in the East China Sea. Other countries voiced similar concerns, including Taiwan, the UK, and South Korea. 
our own foreign secretary, Secretary Albert De, Ros De Rosario, described the Chinese move as an infringement which compromises the safety of civil aviation. Foreseeing a potential China ADIC, and he said this over two, week, over, over two weeks ago, or almost two weeks ago, over the West Philippine Sea, Secretary De Rosario said that the deployment of the only air, air carrier, aircraft carrier of China, the Leoning, to the West Philippine Sea is adding to the sense of instability already rising in the region. What Secretary De Rosario was merely forecasting two weeks ago is now becoming a fact. Because I think two days ago, Ambassador Ma of, of, of China categorically stated that an ADIC will be established over the Philippine, West Philippine Sea. This series of events heightens the tensions over disputed island, islands surrounded by waters rich in fisheries, minerals, and gas. Some analysts say, though, behind China's aggressive assertion of sovereignty is the larger goal of who, of who will control this vast and vital region. The goal being, they suggest, that China wants to rest and meet that dominance over this uh, region. In fact, this grand aspiration has just been recently articulated by the new Chinese leader, President Xi. When in his speech delivered at the highly symbolic avenue, venue rather, Tiananmen Square, he urged his people to help realize a Chinese dream of national rejuvenation. He said that achieving the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation is the greatest Chinese dream in modern times. This pronouncement appears but a continuation of a consistent theme that the leaders and thinkers of China for the past almost two centuries had been advocating and articulating in the various uh, forms. The Chinese term, and I hope I pronounced this right, because this is very important. The Chinese term, Fu Xiang, Fu Xiang, meaning wealth and power, best describes the guiding idea behind the people who have led China, who have led China since the earliest, since the 19th, late 19th century, or rather the early 19th century. But the question everyone is asking is, but should China's quest for national glory, for wealth and power, alienate its neighbors and spark tension throughout the region? A virtual return to the Cold War of the past? From one from one Filipino perspective, the answer definitely is no. In fact, I'm surprised and sometimes shocked by the blatant display of force, ignoring its all shared historic, cultural, and economic relations. My personal feelings notwithstanding, we have chosen with the, with the able and energetic assistance of uh, John Nye to launch this forum to promote and encourage recent discussions of this critical question. We really hope that new avenues may be explored and alternative solutions propounded. Filial, cultural, and business ties between the two peoples, the Philippines, the Filipinos, and the Chinese, I submit represent points of convergence that can hopefully create new cooperative mechanisms to lower tensions and create a climate conducive to finding a solution. Parenthetically, 
May I say that when this round table was conceived and organized by John and us uh, almost over a year ago, little did we anticipate the wide scope and depth the question, the question would ultimately and suddenly take on. We intended to focus our concern on, on our own neighborhood, Southeast Asia, South China Sea, or West Philippine Sea. We now realize that, li that, th that this limited focus is not correct, is maybe even mistaken. It must be inevit inevitably include East Asia, encompassing a critical maritime route to which 50% of global oil tanker tonnage amounting to 10 million barrels a day and almost one-third of the globes of the world's global lines worth almost 5.3 trillion US dollars pass through this navigation route. And therefore we're happy, and I think this is quite timely, that we have this eminent uh, panel of speakers uh, to enlighten us, set some guidelines, perhaps, for policymakers on both sides, and to be most important, information points that we can disseminate to enlighten and inform the general public about this, this uh, question. As Justice Tony Carpew said uh, this morning, this West Philippines issue could very well be the number one national security problem of the Philippines in the next generation or so. And therefore, it raises the question whether our policy makers are well informed enough and our people informed enough about this issue because without that, that uh, support, I think uh, like Saba, we may lose almost half of our territorial waters. Our aim to go back, I aim, our aim to repeat is to assess the issue from a fairly objective standpoint and contribute to finding alternative approaches and solutions to the question as well as possible if possible policy considerations. We hope this will shape the debate and enable informed policy making from all sides, from both sides, on this game-changing issue. Thank you very much and let's hope for this.